the maximum log of absolute values of those coordinates. Again, there's like a reasonable extension to Q bar. And then I'm going to want to talk about heights on uh, varieties as well. Um, I guess like smooth projective varieties, but that doesn't really matter too much. Uh, the general idea is like one, one way that you could talk about heights of varieties is just embedding everything in some projective space, or even more loosely, you could just take maps to projective space. So if you have a morphism from your variety to projective space, you could just define a height by, by pulling back the height on projective space or looking at the, the height of the image. And it turns out this mostly just depends on how a hyperplane pulls back or how the O of one uh, bundle, line bundle pulls back to X. Um, and so it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't depend so much on the morphism. It depends mostly just on this, on this line bundle. And then in fact, any, on a projective variety, any line bundle can be written as a difference of, or any divisor, uh, if you prefer, it can be written as a difference of base point free divisors. And so you can define a height on X relative to any divisor or any line bundle as just a difference of the corresponding uh, pullbacks of the heights via these, these different morphisms. And then you just have to check that, that that's not well-defined, but it's not too, not too poorly defined. Um, so, but if you want to, you know, when I talk about heights on varieties, you can, you can usually think of the variety as just being embedded in PN. So um, just as an example of sort of where you've probably seen uh, elliptic curve in short fire stress form, um, non-singular to make it an elliptic curve. And uh, the set of rational points has a group structure on it as, uh, as I'm sure you've all seen. And the, the standard thing to do is to define um, a sort of naive height on the elliptic curve by just taking the height of the X coordinate. So you take the, the two to one map to D1, the standard one, and define the height on, on the elliptic curve by pulling back the height on that. Actually, there are sort of two different camps on this. You might want to multiply that by a half, um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and this plays nicely, this interacts nicely with the, with the group structure, right? So you've, you've probably seen this before that the uh, height of a multiple of a point, um, well, the height is sort of quadratic when you multiply points. And of course, if, and this is, you know, the, the first thing you probably use this to do is to prove the mordell Vey theorem. Um, but here we have these squiggly equal signs. And of course, it'd be a lot nicer for the interaction between heights and uh, the group structure if we could sort of straighten out these, these squiggly uh, lines. So that's that's what the neuron tate height does. All of this talk, well, that's that's a bit of an overstatement, but a large part of this talk will be about straightening out squiggly lines. Um, right. So uh, if the height of two to the k times p grows sort of like four to the k, and if you divide by four to the k and take a limit, you might expect that to converge, and indeed it does. And that's the definition of the neuron tate height. And the neuron tate height has these, you know, three nice sort of um, Fundamental properties, fundamental in the sense that these uniquely, well, the first two, I guess, uniquely determine uh, the neuron tate height. The first is that um, it is exactly quadratic. So I have, as promised, straightened out the squiggly lines. Uh, and then it's, it is the height you started with up to some bounded function, right? So there's, you, you haven't departed too far from this, this sort of honest geometric height function that actually comes from a map to projective space. Um, you, haven't, you haven't differed from it, it too much. And as like a, a sort of uh, example of how this plays nicely with the group structure, points of canonical height zero. So this is this is sort of a priori a non-negative function, and it vanishes precisely on points of finite order. So it's this nice interaction between this uh, canonicalized height function and uh, and the group structure. Again, this is over Q bar. If you're working over a function field, which uh, we'll get to, um, it's like a little bit a little bit fishier. What happens when the canonical height is zero? Okay, so a natural question you might ask is how does this height function vary as E varies? And that's a vague question. Um, there are lots of different versions of this that you could ask. And lots of them are interesting, but here I wanna make this concrete in a, in a very specific way. So for example, if I take a varying family of elliptic curves, so this is an elliptic curve for almost all T, you can figure out which is like four values of T where it's not an elliptic curve, I think. Uh, and this is a point on that elliptic curve for almost all values of t, well, for all the values of t that, for which that thing is an elliptic curve. And so there's this nice, fu nice function, t maps to the canonical height of that point, 
And that could be an interpretation of a question of how the canonical height varies in a family. Like how does it vary along uh, this parameterized family of points? Or if you want to think of this as an elliptic surface, P is a, a section of your elliptic surface and you're sort of wandering along the section and computing the canonical height on each fiber. And the question is, how does that vary as a function of T? And for that, I guess you want T to stay in, in Q or in Q bar or something like that. So uh, there's a, a first answer to this question from, uh, I think this is Joe Silverman's PhD thesis. Um, in fact, I'm 99% certain this is Joe Silverman's, in, in Joe Silverman's PhD thesis. So suppose you have a family of elliptic curves over a curve B. So you can think of this as elliptic surface. I'd like to think about it being defined over the function field. But um, if you're not sort of familiar with the theory of elliptic surfaces, I, I really just mean that you have an elliptic curve whose coefficients are functions on the curve B. And uh, you can specialize that and get uh, elliptic curves defined over your number field K by just plugging in points on your curve B. And there'll be a few points where the thing is singular, but in general, you'll get uh, an elliptic curve over K. And similarly, a point P defined over the function field, I just mean that its coordinates are um, functions on B. And again, you can specialize. Um, and then this result of Silverman says basically that the height on the fiber above T is the height on the generic fiber, which I'll uh, define in a second, times the height of the parameter plus some error term. And the error term, all we know about the So little o here, little o of x over x goes to zero as x goes to infinity. So we just know that eventually this is smaller than this, um, and smaller by you know an arbitrary amount eventually as as the height of the parameter goes to infinity. So the height on the generic fiber, um, well, I would need to define heights and function fields to sort of make sense of this. But heights and function fields are degrees. So the height on the generic fiber p here, this point on your elliptic curve, its uh, coordinates are functions on b, so they have degrees. So you can talk about the degree of the point, and you can just define the height on the generic fiber to be the degree of 2 to the k p divided by 4 to the k. And that's so it's the same definition, just using degree as height. OK, so you get sort of, you know, this is what you expect the height on a certain fiber to be. Um, so a little while later, there was an improvement uh, to this result by Tate. Um, and I'll, I'll say on the next slide exactly how this is an improvement, because it's not maybe immediately obvious that this is a direct improvement on the previous statement. But so what Tate proved is that in the same setting, so just so I don't have to have all my, my hypotheses again, uh, there is in fact some divisor D on the base curve so that the height on the fiber above T of your, your parameterized family of points is just the height of T with respect to that divisor, plus a bounded function. and in some sort of schools of thought, uh, these height functions on varieties, as I said, okay, in some, in some schools of thought, these height functions are O of one equivalence classes. And so this plus O of one is sort of the, the minimal error you could ever, ever hope for, although um, maybe I'll say something more about that in, in a slide or two. So again, this, it might not be totally clear why this is a direct improvement on this result of Silverman. I just wanna make a few remarks about heights on curves. Uh, again, if you're not super familiar with this. Um, so if you have two divisors or two line bundles on, of the same degree on a curve B, then the heights associated to those things, right? So you have, let's say, two different embeddings of your curve into projective space so that these are pullbacks of hyperplanes. Um, then it turns out the heights with respect to those two divisors will be very closely related. So they will be the same up to a square root error term. And in fact, if your base curve happens to be P1, then things get even better, right? So the heights associated to any two divisors are the same up to O of one, up to a bounded amount. And this just corresponds to the fact that on P1, divisors of the same degree are linearly equivalent, and on an arbitrary curve, they're algebraically equivalent. And so if you just plug this information into uh, Tate's result, so the divisor that, um, that Tate uh, constructs has to have this degree, it turns out. That's a pretty simple thing to show just from both asymptotics being true. H of B, unless I specify some divisor, would just be any degree one height function. So any height function relative to a point on the curve. Uh, and so it follows from Tate's result that you can replace that little O of the height by a big O of the square root of the height. And in fact, 
when your base curve is T1, you can replace this even further by O of 1. Um, so that sort of gives uh, maybe some clarity on how exactly Tate's result is sort of a direct improvement on Silverman's result. You can think of it as, it's a little bit stronger than this, in fact, but you can think of it as uh, sharpening up this error term from just saying it is an error term, uh, right? So Silverman's result, we know if we divide by the height and let the height go to zero, the, the sorry, height go to infinity, then that error term goes to zero. Here we know like how it goes to zero. Uh, and I'm going to mention, maybe I'll mention one um, quick application. So why would you be interested in this variation of heights result other than, you know, it's kind of intrinsically, I think it's kind of intrinsically interesting. Um, so one reason you might be interested in it is if you have a, like a family of elliptic curves or if you have an elliptic surface, if you want to think about it that way, the sort of generic points on your elliptic curve over the function field, uh, if you start plugging in points on your curve to everything in sight, you are specializing your elliptic curve to an elliptic curve over the number field. And you're also, you can specialize all of your generic points to points over the number field. Again, this is for all the finally many values of t. Uh, and so you get, for every t, you get a homomorphism from the sort of generic group of points, or if you think about this as an elliptic surface from the group of sections um, to the group of points on a given fiber. And so, and, and as I mentioned, it's easy to show this is a group homomorphism. And so you might ask, okay, what are the properties of this homomorphism? Is it uh, surjective um, in general? Almost certainly not. Uh, is it injective? Well, it turns out that you can use that variation of heights result to show that this map is from a set of bounded heights. So if the height of T is large enough, this map is gonna be injective. And I guess you can do that this to, one of the claims I've heard is that you, you can use this to produce uh, elliptic curves of large rank by taking something that generically has large rank and specializing. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's really. Uh, I mean, I think that that idea has been exploited. I guess. Um, before I move on to talk about uh, canonical heights in arithmetic dynamics, I want to mention one more result that's uh, very recent, just to sort of show that like this. Uh, the, the elliptic curve scenario sort of continues to develop. So here's a, a further refinement of, I guess, Tate's result uh, from la published last year that the, so in fact, this function T maps to the canonical height of, of P on the fiber above T. Uh, this function is, is not just up to O of one of A height on the base, um, but there's this result of DeMarco and Mavraki that in fact it is precisely uh, without the any error term uh, the height induced by some adelically metrized line bundle with continuous metrics. And I won't go into, you know, what continuous metrics are or a metrization of a, or an adelic metrization of a line bundle. But this, this is exactly the machinery you need to apply uh, equidistribution results. And in this paper, they get some nice sort of unlikely intersection results by this further refinement of, of Tate's, Tate's um, result. And so there's continued, continued work in the elliptic curve setting. Uh, but I want to move on to the arithmetic dynamics uh, setting. <clears throat> so now I'm going to let X be a um, smooth projective variety. And F is going to be an endomorphism of X. And one thing one might wish to study, and one thing one does study in, in arithmetic dynamics, is orbits of points. So you start with a point on X and start applying F and the question is like, what happens? I guess at this point, there's no arithmetic, there's only algebra, so this is like algebraic dynamics. Um, for example, Newton's method, right? It's a, it's a sort of canonical example. Newton's method, if you wanna find the roots of a polynomial, you construct this auxiliary rational function and you start iterating and you may or may not converge in some topology to the root of a polynomial. Um, so again, as a simple example, I mean, that was a simple example which uh, in which X is P1, and f is a rational function of one variable. And again, I mentioned uh, that you could, you know, restrict attention in certain ways. Actually, there's not much that's lost if you, a little bit, but not much that's lost if you restrict attention to this. This is the example I always think about. Um, and then the question is how, how general the proof actually is. Uh, but if you restrict attention, again, just to this example, uh, you still sort of gain, gain most of the benefit of the results that will follow. So if you're going to apply the machinery of heights to something like this, the question is what happens to heights of points under the application of F? And here we have, we have some relation between the height of a point and the height of F of a point. 
uh, sort of like the, the relationship on an elliptic curve. Um, here, instead of squiggly equals, I put in an O of one to make it a little more clear, but the height, it's, it's pretty easy to show that the height of F of a point is the degree of F times the height of the point plus some bounded amount that only depends on F. And so you can sort of play uh, the same game as you do in constructing the neuron Tate height. In general, uh, we're, we're not going to think about the case where f has degree 1. We'll always think about the case where f has degree 2, so that those heights on the previous slide are actually growing when you apply f. And then with that assumption, the height of, if you apply fk times to p, the height should be like d to the k times whatever you started with. And just like with the neuron tate height, you can, you can write down this limit here, which is sort of smoothing out the error on the previous slide. And it turns out this always converges. And this is going to be the canonical height I don't think I even said anywhere on the slide that this is the canonical height associated to f. Uh, and it has properties that are very similar to the neuron Tate height. So it, it transforms nicely with respect to f. So we get exact equality with uh, squiggly lines for the neuron Tate height that I removed. And here I had an O of 1 that I removed. But the, o, the squiggly lines represented an O of 1. Uh, and again, it's not too different from the sort of naive height. It's, it differs by a bounded function from the naive height. And completely analogously to the uh, property that torsion points were exactly those of canonical height zero or uh, narrow tate height zero on an elliptic curve, the canonical height here vanishes uh, exactly on point. Nice dynamic interpretation of the vanishing of this a priori non-zero function. Sorry, a priori non-negative function. And in fact, you can tie this to the narrow and tate height in kind of two ways. One is if you've ever doubled a point on an elliptic curve, you've no doubt observed that the x-coordinate of twice a point, if, if your curve is in short fire stress form, the x-coordinate of twice a point is just some rational function of the x-coordinate of the point. It doesn't have, it doesn't have y in it. Um, and this function f here, this is what's called a Lattes example. Uh, you can show pretty easily that the neuron Tate height of a point is just the canonical height with respect to this function of the x coordinate. Assuming you've normalized things properly, whether or not you divided by two uh, on that slide, where I divided by two. Um, but actually, you can give a, a sort of more general construction of this canonical height, which in directly includes the neuron Tate height. So let me. Uh, give you the definition of something in the title, a polarized dynamical system. So by a polarized dynamical system, I mean an endomorphism of this variety X that I was talking about, and an ample line bundle L or ample divisor, if you prefer, on X, uh, such that F pulls L back to some multiple of itself or some tensor power, if you want to think in terms of line bundles, for some D greater than or equal to 2. Uh, so this is, if X is P1, this is exactly saying that F Sorry, if x is p1 and l is o of 1, or I guess actually any ample line bundle on p1, this is exactly saying that you have a rational function degree d. And this, this property is enough to give you this height relation that we had. And this height relation was enough to define that canonical height. So in fact, this is in this more general setting, uh, you have everything you need to define this canonical height function. It has the same basic properties. Uh, and this was, uh, I guess this construction was described by Call and Silverman, and now I'm um, maybe 1993. I'm uh, I'm blanking on the year, and also uh, Shou Wuzhang, uh, a little bit later, but maybe semi-independently. And in fact, you don't even need. There's nothing here that requires this divisor to be ample, uh, except if you want to conclude that points of canonical height zero are still are still preperiodic. So, for instance, you could take an elliptic curve, and you can take uh, a point on your elliptic curve. And you could take f to be an endomorphism of your elliptic curve, and you would construct the narrow t height if your endomorphism is not a unit or something like that. OK, so it, in fact, so it seems like that was already general enough. Um, and why would you want to generalize more? But in fact, you can, you can make a, an even more general construction of canonical heights. And this is, in fact, uh, so now this is, this is the definition, really, that sort of Colin Silverman gave. Um, so let's, again, let's let X be a smooth projective variety. F is an endomorphism. And now instead of uh, a divisor or a line bundle on X, I'm going to take um, like a formal linear combination with real coefficients, right? So you can just think of this as I'm taking 
uh, if you want to think in terms of divisors, because we write them additively, it's a little nicer. Uh, I can take a formal real linear combination of divisors, and I can pull that back by just pulling back the linear combination formally, and it may or may not be a real multiple of itself. You may or may not have like an eigenvector. So this is a vector space now over R, and F star is some linear map on that vector space. And uh, if you have a divisor or a, a line bundle in here, which pulls back to, which is a, an eigenvector, with positive eigenvalue, or not positive, sorry, bigger than one, then the whole construction goes through. So d greater than or equal to two was really just d strictly greater than one. And you might ask, okay, do I really need this more general setting? Uh, is there anything interesting that happens when I allow myself real coefficients instead of just integral coefficients for my, for my divisors? Uh, and it turns out, yes. So there's this really nice paper by Silverman uh, constructing canonical heights for automorphisms of Baylor K3 surfaces. And so I'll just go through this kind of quickly. I mean, I, the point is just to convince you that you might want to do this outside of the context of just things with integral coefficients. But uh, so let's let X be a Baylor K3 surface. So this is a sub variety of P2 times P2, which is the intersection of a bilinear form and a bi-quadratic form. Um, and O of A, B here is going to be A hyperplanes on this P2 and B hyperplanes on this P2. And it turns out that the pullback of these automorphisms act like this matrix on these line bundles. Uh, and this matrix has real eigenvalues. So if you allow yourself to go to Q adjoin root three, you can find uh, a line bundle, which is an eigenvector for that pullback map. And now you can see height for this automorphism. Uh, so L here is not ample, in fact. Um, but you still can construct a canonical height and get some sort of interesting, interesting things out of that um, for these Valor K3 surfaces. For the most part, though, I'm going to be fine with just taking things with integral coefficients. So one can ask the same sort of question, uh, the same sort of variation of heights question. If everything in sight, right? So your variety X, your endomorphism F, your line bundle L. Uh, and a point P, if all those things are parameterized over some curve, then for all but finitely many points on the curve, you can sort of plug in a value and specialize your family to some point. And that gives you a function that associates to a point T on your curve. So T here is, whoops, T here is a point on your curve. Uh, you associate to every or all but finitely many T on your curve the canonical height of p of t with respect to this dynamical system f of t on your variety x of t relative to uh, the divisor or line bundle l of t and uh, a result of colin silverman so here i did not write in the year which i did for everything else i think this was i think this was 1993 um colin silverman sort of generalized this result of silverman and showed that the height in a family varies like the height on the generic fiber times the height of the parameter uh, plus some error term. Right? So th this is sort of the minimal result you could get um, while still knowing that that uh, this, this is an error term. This is a main term. This is an error term. OK. So uh, again, just like in the elliptic curve case, there's sort of a, a natural uh, example or natural application so if the height on the generic, if the canonical height on the generic fiber is strictly positive, then the result, one of the consequences of the result on the previous slide is that the set of specializations such that P specializes to a pre-periodic point for F uh, will be a set of bounded height. So on, if on the generic fiber, the canonical height is positive, one consequence of that is that your the orbit of P under F is infinite. And then you might ask, well, you know, if I start specializing, when do I accidentally get a finite orbit? Uh, and this will be a set of bounded height. And the proof of that, once you believe the asymptotic, is, is pretty easy, that uh, if you specialize and get something with a finite forward orbit, the canonical height is going to be 0 when you specialize. But the canonical height is supposed to be this positive thing times the height of t plus something smaller than the height of t as the height of t goes to infinity. And so as the height of t goes to infinity, this thing can't keep canceling out this thing. And so in particular, the proof is ineffective, right? The proof is like, if you, if you don't believe it's a set of bounded height, then I'll take a limit in that set uh, that will create a contradiction. Um, 
I mentioned, so in, in uh, if, if your divisor is ample and you're working over Q bar, then the having finite orbit is exactly the same as having canonical height zero. If you're working in the function field setting, so on the, on the generic fiber, having canonical height zero um, would lead you to suspect that pre P is, has the finite forward orbit. Um, but the, the actual statements that one can prove, and these are results of, of uh, Benedetto and Baker and Gautier and Vigny, is that either if the canonical height is zero on the generic fiber, either P is in fact generically pre-periodic or there's some sort of isotriviality uh, going on. So in the dimension one case, you can make a very precise isotriviality statement in the, in the higher dimensional setting. There's something about X has some sub variety, which is periodic under F and that becomes isotrivial or something like that. There's, um, but there's some sort of isotriviality hiding in the background. Okay, so, well, you have an asymptotic and you have the, the sort of barest possible um, error term. And so, of course, naturally, Colin Silver and ask if it is possible to improve this error term. And I just want to remind you of what, what Tate's improvement was in the elliptic curve setting. So, in the elliptic curve setting, for a specific, for some specific height function, uh, again, if I don't specify, the height functions are all degree one on the base curve. Um, so, Tate showed that for some specific height function, you can get the error term to O of one. And so that means for, for any height function of degree one on the base curve, you can get the error term to O of the square root of the height, or O of one if you happen to be lucky enough to be working over P1. So that's just a reminder of sort of what you might expect to be able to do um, given Tate's improvement in the elliptic curve. So here are a few, a few sort of earlier results in this direction. Um, so here's, I've combined two results here. Uh, so as a, as a first sort of stab at things, suppose you have a family of endomorphisms of Pn, and I'm going to impose uh, a significant additional condition here. So I'm going to suppose that my family admits a totally invariant hyperplane. And I'm also going to assume that when I restrict f to that hyperplane, my family is constant. So on that hyperplane, my family is just, is just one particular map. And then as you wander off that hyperplane, that's where the variation happens. Uh, then in that case, you can get exactly this Tate, Tate style uh, improvement. Um, so you get the O of one error term for some particular height function. And then again, if you want to replace this with an arbitrary degree one height, this becomes the square root of, of the height. And this is a sort of a weird condition here having, so if you haven't done any dynamics, then what does it mean? Like how you know, specialized does this make my family if there's a totally invariant hyperplane? Uh, so when n equals one, so if you're talking about rational functions of one variable, this condition of having a totally invariant hyperplane such that this restriction to the invariant hyperplane is constant, this is equivalent to saying that your family of rational functions is actually a family of polynomials. And so that n equals one was this earlier result. And then uh, this is just sort of generalizing the, the condition that was used in dimension one appropriately. But once you see this in n equals one, we can prove this for families of polynomials. The question then becomes, well, what, can you say anything for rational functions? You'd like to say something for rational functions. So uh, another result uh, that was also fairly early on was this result of Kyoka and Mavraki. Now for this particular family of rational functions, you get the same result. And I, I'm not sure, this may have only been over when the base curve is P1. Uh, oh, sorry, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, because there's only one, there's only one parameter here. So it's going to be your function field is whatever a joint T. Uh, so I, I, I withdraw that, uh, that claim. And already for this one particular family of rational functions, this is a pretty non-trivial, it's not, it's not some simple generalization of the proof up here. It's a fairly non-trivial, um, extension. Uh, but nonetheless, this was sort of pushed further by, um, Mavraki and Yi a few years later. Uh, so the same result is true. Now this is over, over the base P1. Um, so the same is true for an arbitrary family of rational functions under the additional hypothesis that the pair F comma P is quasi-adelic. And I won't, I won't define quasi-adelic here. Um, it's it's uh, just like I won't define adelically metrized line bundle. Um, this condition of being quasi-adelic though is something that uh, I believe it, it is known if F is a polynomial, so kind of consistent with the other results. Uh, in general, for a given rational function, 
um, or sorry, for rational functions in general, it's not known whether we should expect this pair to always have this property. So in fact, this, this might prove this for all rational functions of one variable, uh, and we just don't know it yet, um, but there is this additional hypothesis. Similar results here, I think this is also in the case where the base is the projective line. Um, so Gilker, Shaw, and Tucker basically reduce this condition of having a totally ramified fixed point to having just a ramified fixed point. Um, there's similar results for Drinfeld modules and for families of Hanon maps. So there are a bunch of special cases where some sort of strong uh, asymptotic is known, um, but not, uh, not anything sort of very general. So now I'm going to maybe propose a sort of more modest, uh, more modest improvement. Um, this is one of the things where you sort of like want to set up what you did as like a reasonable question to answer. Uh, so I'm going to propose a more modest improvement. So yet again, I'm going to remind you of Tate's result here. So a consequence of Tate's result, uh, Tate's result again is, is stronger than this, but a consequence of Tate's result is that if you want to understand this asymptotic for an arbitrary degree one height function on the base, then what Tate has done is improve the error term to a square root error term. Uh, or again, O of one, if you're, if you're happy enough to be living um, in the situation where your, your function field is rational. So a more modest question might be, can I take this ineffective error term? So here I divide by the height, let the height go to infinity, and this goes to zero in some deeply mysterious way. Can I say something about how it goes to zero? And in particular, can I say that it goes to zero like a negative power of the height. Um, so that's a reasonable thing to ask. And uh, it turns out that you can. And in fact, delta doesn't need to be that small. So let me um, state this result. And then I'll give you a little bit of an idea how, how we prove it. Uh, by the way, the, the most difficult thing in preparing for this talk was trying to decide which year the pandemic we're in. So I think we're in year one of the pandemic, but uh, I think last year was year zero, but we can we can debate that extensively later. Um, but if you're still using common era uh, times, then this is this is um, this will be on the archive, I think, next week if you want to get like a really precise date here. Uh, so here's the statement. So suppose we have one of these families of polarized dynamical systems. And here I'm I'm taking divisors or line bundles with integral coefficients. So I'm not tensoring up with R at this point. And I, I am still assuming that L is ample. Um, yeah, so I need L to be ample here. Uh, so this is the what I think of as uh, the, the Shou Zhang definition of a polarized dynamical system. And then the sort of more general thing where we allow non-ample divisors and we allow real coefficients, I think of that as the Call Silverman canonical height construction. Uh, so it turns out that you can, for a family like this, you can improve the error term. And you can get one of these power savings. And, and the power savings is, is just a bit smaller than you would hope for. So here, uh, in general, we get a power savings. We save a, a third in the exponent. And then if the base is P1, we save a half in the exponent. Um, so I kind of want to, you know, I almost want to have this third condition here. And then the, the Tate version would be shifting everything up one. So we're not, we're not quite there, but we get some sort of improvement on the error term. And one corollary of this, uh, or corollary, depending on, on how you want to pronounce it, uh, is that, that that claim that if you look at the set of, so if, if this thing is positive, if the canonical height on the generic fiber is positive, and you now look at which specializations give you, right? So if the canonical height on generic fiber is positive, that means generically your orbit is infinite. If you now look at the set of t for which the orbit becomes finite, this is now a set of bounded height, and it's there's an effective bound. Um, and the reason there's an effective bound is once you have this error term bounded by a constant times a smaller power of the height, if you set this equal to zero um, and just rearrange things, you'll get that in this case the height the height to the one third is bounded by by this. Uh, well, with whatever constant you have here, um, there's a little bit of a a fishy use of effective here um, because I could mean that it's effective modulo knowing what this constant is, or I could be claiming that there is an effective constant here. Uh, and in fact, the latter thing is, is true, uh, although I've only really worked that out in the case of P1. Uh, 
Um, so it's true that in general, in fact, you can make this asymptotic effective, you can make the error terms explicit. Um, but if, if your base curve is not P1, then everything depends on all sorts of highly unnatural quantities that come up from various arbitrary choices. In the case of P1, you can make all your constants and error terms sort of depend on you know, semi-intuitive things. Okay, so I'm gonna give a little sketch of uh, the proof. Um, and for simplicity here, I'm gonna take X to be PN. Uh, I'm gonna take L to be O of one, or if you think in terms of divisors, this is just gonna be hyperplane. That just means my heights with respect to L are just like the standard height on projective space that I started with. And my base curve for simplicity, I'm gonna allow this to be P1. This is actually not just for simplicity. So in, in the paper, this is the first case that's treated and this is treated separately. But I'm gonna sort of explain to you basically how the, the proof that Colin Silverman use works and then how, uh, how I sort of modify that proof to get these, these stronger asymptotics. So it really is, it is a sort of technical modification of what Colin Silverman do. So here's what Colin Silverman do. Um, what you'd like to bound in some way or other is this difference, the difference between the specialized canonical height and the generic canonical height times the height of the, of the specialization. And here I've, dro I've dropped my subscript B because B is P1, and this is just the really the basic height of a even rational number, if you like. Um, and so the way Colin Silverman do this is they break this up, and this is exactly the same way that Silverman's proof for elliptic curves works. They break this up as a sum of three things and bound these things separately. So first I'll start, I'll start with this last one. This, this last thing here, if P is fixed, this is actually just some number times the height of T. And so this is certainly big O of the height of T because it's just some number of times the height of T. But in fact, the difference between the canonical height on the generic fiber and the degree of P is bounded independent of P. So just the bound just depends on F. So this last term is, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to show that this is just bounded by some constant that depends on F times the height of T. And the first term, <clears throat> In fact, in general, on every fiber, let me write Q here. So from what I said originally about the canonical height, on every fiber, uh, the canonical height should be the naive height plus some error term, some bounded error term that depends on which fiber you're on. And it's pretty easy to show if you sort of examine that limit, uh, the limit sort of converges uniformly in some way. And so the error term, you can actually make it explicit and just make it linear in the height of T. So here, this term here is gonna be bounded linearly in the height of T without even using the fact that P is like a parameterized family of points. And again, this also just depends on F. It doesn't depend on what you're plugging in. So the first and the last term are bounded by just a constant times the height of T. And then the middle term is what it is. But it, again, if you think about the case of P1, and in fact, if you take N to be one, then P here is also a rational function of one variable. And so the height of P of T is the degree of P times the height of T plus some bounded error. Uh, so that's bounded by O of one, but that O of one depends on P. So the idea that Colin Silverman have is I'm going to divide both sides by the height of T. I'll divide this side by the height of T. And if I do that, uh, again, on the left, I get whatever I get. On, on the right here, I get O of one. So I get some bounded error term. And then here, if I divide this by the height of T, I get uh, a constant over the height of T. So if I take the limit as the height of t goes to infinity, this is just going to vanish. Right. So uh, in fact, you don't know it's a limit. It's a priori a limb soup. So the first step of the proof is we sort of show that if we divide by the height of t, uh, t this limb soup is bounded by some constant. And this constant depends only on f. But now you're in this sort of weird situation. If you, because of this functional equation, the height of f of p, the canonical height of f of p is d times the canonical height of p. If I replace, whoops, a little scribble there. If I replace p with, let's say, fk of p, I should be scaling this limb soup up by a factor of d to the k. But on the other hand, it doesn't depend on p. 
Uh, and so C times D to the K should still be C. Or if you think about it differently, I could sort of uh, replace P by FK of P and divide by D to the K and get the same thing. But now my upper bound has gone from C to C over D to the K and K here is arbitrary. And so the limb soup actually has to be bounded above by zero or limb soup in fact has to be zero because it's smaller than any positive value. And so if the limb soup is zero, that means the limit exists and is zero because this is non-negative. And uh, that's, that's what the, the call Silverman variation of heights result is saying. It's saying that this limit is zero. So what are we gonna do to improve this? Um, it turns out to not be that hard, uh, but uh, there's, there's a lot of sort of fiddly technical work. Um, but the strategy is to take that middle term. So the only reason we had to take a limit as the height of t goes to infinity is we had this O of one that depends on p that we wanted to get rid of. And so <clears throat> the strategy is just gonna be to make that explicit. So from the theory of heights, in fact, any, any book you read that introduces the theory of heights will tell you that you know, this, this is bounded by something that depends on p. And if you want, you can use the, uh, um, the sort of explicit versions of Hilbert's null Schellenzatz to make this explicit. Um, but then nobody, nobody sort of follows through on that in those introductory books. Uh, but so the idea is we're just going to try to make this bound explicit in a way that makes it useful to replace uh, when we replace P with FK of P. So in particular, again, P here is now, given the restrictions I've made, it's a morphism from P1 to Pn. So it's just a tuple of n plus one polynomials in T. And it turns out that if you do some effective elimination of variables, uh, you can replace, you can one that depends on P and rewrite it as some absolute O, which I guess just depends on N, uh, times the degree of P um, times the height of P plus the degree of P. And here the height of P, P is some big tuple of uh, polynomials. And I just mean, take the big tuple of coefficients uh, that's some point in projective space and just take the height of that. Um, and in fact, so when I wrote this up in the paper, I, I was trying to use various people's explicit versions of Hilbert's null Schellenzatz and none of them, none of them could be easily applied in exactly the way I wanted to do it. Um, but it turns out that you can say you're using the explicit Hilbert's null Schellenzatz and actually just do a whole bunch of linear algebra, elementary linear algebra to get a bound like this. Um, the big tool there is Kramer's rule, which maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't admit, but um, so teaching, teaching linear algebra can be useful for your research. Okay, so now I'm gonna replace P with FK of P. And so I need to get some estimate on how the degree of FK of P grows with K and how the height of the coefficients of FK of P grow with K. And both of those things, it turns out, this is, this is fairly straightforward to show. These things both grow like T to the K. So if you fix P, sorry, fix F and fix P, but now I'm gonna be thinking not about P, but F to the K of P, uh, then both of these things just grow like D to the K. And so in particular, if I replace P with F K of P in my inequality, which is my, my goal, uh, then this error term I can make explicit and it grows like D to the 2K. <clears throat> I say at most D to the 2K. I don't, I'm not claiming any sort of lower bound on how that grows. Okay, so if you take this error term here and you plug that back into the uh, proof that Colin Silverman have, uh, so what are you doing? You're gonna take this difference, you're gonna replace P by FK of P and divide by D to the K and it should still be the same thing. Uh, and then you have an error term of D to the 2K, which when you divide by D to the K becomes D to the K. And then you also had some error term that was linear in the height and you divide that by d to the k and you just get height over d to the k. And then once you get this error term, so I guess the, the sort of synopsis is call and Silverman's proof involves first letting the height go to infinity and then separately letting k to go to infinity. But now that we have this error term explicit in both the height and k, we'll just let them both go to infinity. And the optimal way to do that is by taking d to the k to be, again, squiggly lines, um, roughly the square root of the height. And of course, then both of these terms are the square root of the height and that's your, that's your error term. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, you can, you can make all of these um, error terms and, and so on completely explicit in this, in this particular case. Uh, 
In the case of a general base curve, it's like a, a little more annoying. Okay, so this, this gives you the, the proof in the case where your variety is Pn and your base curve is P1. It turns out that, in fact, the, considering the case where your variety is Pn kind of handles the general case. So this is this beautiful result of um, Fakrudin. Again, I didn't put a year down, but if you have um, some polarized dynamical system, Fakrudin gives a, a nice construction of, so you can embed your variety in projective space and your endomorphism of X will extend to a rational endomorphism of projective space. And Fakrudin shows that you can always do this in a way that this is actually an endomorphism. Uh, and so um, certain problems about endomorphisms of projective varieties, if, if you follow through this embedding, certain problems can then be reduced just to endomorphisms of projective space. And this is one of those problems. So in fact, this, this proof treats the general case, uh, but not in the case where B is a general curve. That's a you need to use a, a slightly weaker result on elimination of variables there. Okay, so that's uh, the variation of heights result for this sort of strong definition of uh, polarized dynamical system. I did mention these Valor K3 surfaces um, that I'm, I'm fond of, and I was kind of disappointed that this result does not apply to these families or uh, does not apply to families of these Valor K3 surfaces. And uh, in some ways, there's, there's a sort of semi-fundamental reason for this. I don't have a version of this result of Fuck-Rudin for once you start allowing real coefficients on your divisors. But it turns out that you can prove something that uh, implies a... So on this last slide, I'm, I'm gonna restrict attention to my base being P1. And I'll read, the, I'll read the corollary first. So the corollary is for uh, families of Baylor K3 surfaces with these automorphisms that Silverman constructed, you get a variation of heights result. Uh, and it's just instead of the height to the one half in the error term, you get the height uh, to the one half plus epsilon for any, did I say, yeah, for any epsilon greater than zero. So you don't quite get the one half for, for kind of interesting reasons, um, but you get arbitrarily close to one half. Uh, for more general, canonical heights associated to um, divisors with real coefficients, you can get a variation of heights result and <clears throat> you get this sort of sum improvement on little o of the height. So you get big O of height to the one minus delta plus any epsilon, uh, where delta is some, some quantity that depends on how F star acts on uh, a certain free submodule of the Picard group that you're free to choose that contains your eigen divisor. Um, and the delta here is, so alpha is going to be an eigenvalue. So F star is going to act like a matrix on this submodule of the, the Picard group. Um, alpha is some eigenvalue of that matrix. And delta here is that eigenvalue over two times the largest modulus of an eigenvalue. So the spectral radius of A. Um, and it just, in this Valor K3 surface example, and in fact, in every example that I've seen in the wild, uh, alpha is the spectral radius. And so this delta becomes a half, and that's why you get this nice one half plus epsilon. So we can still say something about Valor K3 surfaces, but I will leave with a question. Um, it's, if you sort of take the join of the two things uh, and you ask, what about this stronger statement in the case of uh, B general, I haven't figured out how to do that. So I don't think that's a simple modification of the two proofs or sort of combining them in some simple way. Um, but so that's still that's still an open question that that is worth uh, thinking about. All right, thank you. Questions for him. Questions for Patrick. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning of the talk that when f was a degree one, you couldn't say much, and uh, and I didn't quite catch that why that was. Uh, what was the problem when f has degree one for the limitation? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've I've gotten in trouble with people for for saying this. So in the case of a rational function of one variable, 
uh, if you sort of talk about dynamics of rational functions of degree one, this is related to subgroups of PGL2, which is interesting. It's definitely very interesting, um, but it's it's fundamentally different. And so the thing, the, the property um, that I wanted to exploit is that when you apply a function of degree D, you scale up heights by a factor of D. But if D is one, and so the idea is you eventually sort of outrun uh, your various error terms and you can define this canonical height. But when the degree is one, scaling up by a factor of one doesn't help you outrun these error terms. Oh, okay. All right. Um, In fact, if you if you iterate your function, the, the height will sort of stay the same, but the error term will keep piling up. And so eventually the error term will outrun the main term. Uh, right. It's like you're missing something to bound it and, and then it just explodes. Um, the, what did you say exactly that um, this is related to when the degree is one, the PGL2? Yeah, so, good. so your rational function of degree one, right? It'll be a, like a Mobius transformation. And so it's it's an element of PGL2. Essentially, it's like it's given by a matrix, right? your rational function, you can write it as a, as a fractional linear transform. And iteration of that rational function is just taking powers of, of the corresponding matrix. And so you can ask all sorts of questions about like, you know, finite subgroups of PGL2. Um, but it's, it's uh, so I yeah, I wouldn't say it's not interesting, but it's it's separate and the heights aspect of it is is not interesting, at least so far as I've sort of thought of it. Okay, thank you. Um, 